Imagine for a moment that every thought, every word you utter, has the power to shape your reality. What would you do with that power? How would your life change if you knew you had absolute control over your destiny? Neville Goddard teaches us that this power is real and within the reach of all of us. Let me make you a promise. By listening to this audiobook, you will discover that you possess an extraordinary gift, a gift that can free you from limitations and lead you to the realization of your deepest dreams. We are not talking about magic or fantasy, but about universal and timeless principles that have been proven time and time again by those who dare to believe and act. Imagine waking up every day knowing that you have the ability to create the life you have always wanted. No more excuses, no more waiting. Here and now, you have the opportunity to transform your inner world to reflect in your outer world. Goddard tells us, the manifested world shows us the use we have made of God's gift. Receiving a gift does not mean we will use it wisely, but we all have that gift. This fundamental truth will be the pillar upon which you build your new reality. By immersing yourself in the art of imagining, manifesting your world, you will learn to use your mind and your words as powerful tools for change. You will discover techniques to reprogram your thoughts, to visualize your goals with clarity, and to have inner conversations that propel you towards success and fulfillment. Don't settle for a life of mediocrity and limitations. Take control, use the power of your imagination, and start manifesting the world you've always dreamed of. This audiobook is your guide, your companion on this journey to a new you. Listen carefully, practice with dedication, and watch your life transform in ways you never thought possible. The whole manifested world is going to show us what use we have made of God's gift. Receiving a gift does not mean that we will use it wisely, but we have the gift, everyone has the gift, and the world simply reflects the use made of that gift. In The Merchant of Venice, Shakespeare puts these words into Portia's mouth. If doing were as easy as knowing what is good to do, the chapels would have been churches and the little houses of the poor prince's palaces. He is a good divine who follows his own instructions. It is easier for me to teach twenty what is good to do than to be one of the twenty who follow my own teachings. So, you and I have been given a gift. What use have we made of it? In a book written at the time of our gospel, called The Hermetic, and in Walter Scott's translation, it is said, There are two gifts which God has given to man alone and to no other mortal creature, and these two gifts are mind and speech, and the gifts of mind and speech are essential and identical with immortality. If properly used, man will not differ in any respect from the immortals, and when he leaves the body, these two will be his guides and lead him to the troop of the gods and to the souls who have attained bliss. Now, he is not talking about any external speech, because you and I have had this experience. I know I have had it many times. You've gone to a party, and a lot of people you don't know, you run into them, and the usual greetings, nice to meet you, nice to meet you, nice to meet you, and the usual cliches. Then you have a few drinks and your little snack, and then the party breaks up and everyone splits up, and you hear someone say, yuck, how boring. Yet they were pleased to meet you, how nice to meet you. The outward words did not at all match what they really thought inside, and God sees not the outer man, he sees the inner man. It is the inner speech that is frozen in the world around us. All this vast world is nothing but frozen inner speech. What do we say inside? We may think that someone really understands us. You go around thinking they understand you, and a simple thing happens, and you realize that they have never really listened to you, or for a moment really heard you. Some little upset and then it's all over. And then they turn on you as if you were the enemy, when before they thought you were one of the sent ones. That's all in the scripture. Read the seventh and eighth chapter of the book of John. And some said, He is a good man. And others said, No, 
he is leading people astray. Others said, well, he is mad and has a demon. When he fed them with the loaves and fishes, oh, they loved him. Getting things in the world, as long as they could have things and things and things, it was wonderful. And then he tells them of something completely different, that they would go through ovens, but the end would justify all the ovens they would go through. The end would be God. They would wake up at the end, and they would wake up as God the Father. He did not speak to them of the nature of the ovens. He only spoke to them of the end, and that they would go through ovens. And as they went through them, they hesitated. They could tell exactly what they were really doing inside. As we are told in Psalm 50, if a man will order his conversations aright, I will show him the salvation of God. If one could control these inner conversations morning, noon and night, and carry them into the dream world, he would know what world he is creating. Stop for a moment and ask yourself, what am I thinking right now? In every moment you are having a little inner discourse. You may be in the presence of someone the world considers important, but you are not, and inside you are saying, but only God hears it. That is what you are really saying. Outwardly you are delighted to meet him, and you are flattered by the contact. But inwardly, what are you saying? This is what I ask everyone to observe. Watch what you're really doing inside, because that's what God sees. And what you are doing inside you are doing in tiny little movements of speech, and they are crystallizing in the manifested world around you. So, if doing were as easy as knowing what is good to do, we would all be kings, we would all be everything we want to be in this world. But we find it harder to do than to know what to do. So I could tell you from now until the end of time, but only practice will do it. Only practice. When a man looks and sees a building that seems beyond his wildest dream of ever acquiring it, and he has reasons he shares with no one except his mother, she is the only one he trusts. And she despairs, because she knows he could never attain ownership of that building. It's too big, too far beyond his dreams, or even his ambition. But he loves her, and only shares with her what he is doing, and he sees a sign that implies he does own it. Well, as he looks at it, he couldn't read the sign and not repeat it inwardly. So, inwardly he's saying, it's my building, as he reads his own name on that building. And day after day, as he passes by, he reads his own name on the building, implying that it is his. And then, out of nowhere, two years later, the owner goes bankrupt and a stranger comes along and offers to put up the money to buy it. He has no collateral, but he owned the building that day. He then ran the most fantastically wonderful and successful business in that company for many, many years. And then an offer came in that offered him many, many times more than he paid for it. He paid 50,000 of somebody else's money for it and sold it, without any capital gain, for 840,000. There was no capital gain, it was all done within a speech, because you couldn't read something without using your lips. Nobody sees it, but I read something, and inwardly I am repeating what I am reading. I saw it here on the bus a few months ago, going to Beverly Hills. And here's a man reading a newspaper, and every word he was reading, he was forming it with his lips. I could watch him. If I could have interpreted the movement of his lips, he could have told you exactly what he was reading because he formed every word. Everybody does it, but not as obviously as he does. So you read something and actually, inwardly, you are repeating the words. Well, now it's all in your imagination. That's all that was in him, just his imagination. That was God's gift. It is translated in the Hermetic, as mind, and God has given man, and only man, two gifts, and no other mortal creature. The gifts are mind, and he speaks, and these are as the gifts of immortality, and by these gifts he does not differ in any respect from the immortals. If he uses them wisely, the whole world is his. We are not told that the world was created by the word of God, and things that are seen were made from things that are not seen. So here, 
Out of nothing we create by inner speech, by the use of what? Call it mind, if you will. I like the word imagination. For me, it inflames me. When I imagine a state, any state, if I can only persuade myself of the reality of the imagined state, that's the important thing, believing in the reality of the imagined state. But knowing what to do is not the same as doing it. So if doing were as easy as knowing what is good to do, well, then the chapels would have been churches and the little houses of the poor, palaces of princes. And how many teachers in the world follow their own instruction? And then he goes on to confess, I can more easily teach twenty what it is good to do than to be one of the twenty who follow my own teaching. So I ask you to really apply it. Don't think for a second that knowing what to do is going to do anything for you. What matters is doing it. So if in every moment you know what to do, then do it. If you find yourself having some negative conversation, break it off, even if it gives you pleasure. Many people find so much fun in being critical. They think they are alone and no one sees them, so it doesn't matter. No one sees you. The only one who matters sees you at all times. And that is your father. He sees deep inside you and knows exactly what you are doing. And your world is built from these inner conversations. So if today you are dissatisfied with the world you live in, blame no one but these two gifts and use them wisely. For here we are told to order our lives according to our conversations. Then in Ephesians we are told in the fourth chapter, put off the old nature that belongs to former conversation and put on the new nature. The new nature is sometimes translated as the new man and the old nature, the old man. Well, if I equate the old nature with the former conversations, I must equate the new man with the new conversations. So he identifies the inner speech with the nature of man. So now, what am I really doing within myself? And I am doing it morning, noon and night. I cannot stop it. If I stop for a moment, it is no more. You can't stop it. You take it into your dreams and you keep talking. You are really talking all the time. So what are you saying at every moment? Watch what you're saying, because your whole vast world is this expelled inner conversation, and you can only change it by changing the conversation, because the conversation is equal to your nature. So if you're walking down the street, or riding the bus, or sitting alone, you're still talking in every moment of time. You are talking. And all you have to do to discover what you've been saying is to observe your world. Your world reflects this inner speech. I've seen it all the time. I'm not going to tell you that I haven't wavered. I won't for a moment tell you that I always monitor inner conversations. The phone rings, something happens, and you've told them over and over again. And your reaction may not have been the most appropriate, but you reacted anyway. No one heard it, but you heard it and your father heard it. And you're going to build your world based on exactly what you've done. So watch it morning, noon and night, because you're going to play this role. The end of everybody's world is Christ. Everybody is moving toward the fullness of being God himself, the whole world. Therefore, the story of Christ told in the Gospels, you are going to interpret it, and when he awakens within you and unfolds within you and you know that you are Christ, you will find those who will eagerly take in all that you have to say. When you give them the loaves and fishes, that is when the conflict in the world begins, where accusations of being a demon arise and people question your sanity. But when you, who have awakened from the sleep of life, hear these things, you rejoice because you know that your end is near. This separation is necessary to separate the sheep from the goats, allowing those who truly follow to continue on the path. I hope that all present will not only listen, but believe what I have said, for I have shared with you what I know from experience. God himself enters human history in the person of Jesus Christ, in you, in me, in everyone. When he comes into you, he awakens like you. 
Everything that is told in the story about Jesus Christ, you will experience. When you share this story with those who easily believe it, when you feed them with the loaves and fishes based on the law, on how to get material things, fame and all that, they love it. But when you emphasize the promise which is, you shall be like God, they may resist. They may desire more material wealth and success, missing the deeper spiritual meaning. Conflict will arise because you did not come to bring peace on earth. You came to bring a sword to separate the old from the new. Families may erupt in conflict over these revelations, turning against you. However, knowing that you are the center of the gospel story, you will rejoice. You will only feel sorry for those who could not follow beyond a certain point, without criticism or condemnation, only realizing that they could not see beyond it. This is all part of the great game of life, so watch carefully what you say morning, noon, and night. When you go to bed, watch your inner conversations. Immediately resolve any anger or negative thoughts and make them conform to your fulfilled desire, which must always be grounded in love. Think about what it would be like if your wish were fulfilled and continue your inner dialogue from that premise, full of love for everyone. If this is your last thought before sleep, it will dominate your dreams. Your father will speak to you through dreams and visions, unfolding the truth within you, revealing that you are indeed the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't go out and shout it from the rooftops. You know it and walk in the comfort of being the awakened man who is God. Let everyone say exactly what they want to say about you and pay no attention to them because they have to. When you get to the end, they have to do it. Separation must take place and don't justify yourself. Self-justification is the voice from hell. So don't justify anything and don't try to be right all the time. Another almost incurable disease of man is the need to always be right. Therefore, do not strive to prove that you are right. You know what you have experienced and you cannot deny the experience. So you go on your way telling it as it comes to you. And it comes to you in the most glorious way. It's all in the scriptures. So when you get to the end, you're not disappointed or surprised that those you sent alive and free now take up arms against you and call you crazy, call you a demon and disrupt their family life. You know exactly what you have done. You have only spoken the truth. And when truth comes into the world, it does not come to bring peace but a sword. It is going to separate you from that traditional background that enslaved you in the past. Because true progress in this world, religious progress, is a gradual transition from a God of tradition to a God of experience. You experience God and everything reflects that. His son calls you father and there is no uncertainty as to who he is and who you are. And all your memory returns and here you stand before your eternal son, and he knows it, and you know it, and no person in the world could in any way dissuade you from knowing it. You have experienced it, you cannot deny it. Therefore, I tell you what awaits you. Use the gift wisely. Begin now to use it, for if you use it, you are told, I will show you the salvation of God. Read it in the last verse of Psalm 50. They translate the word word as conversations or way of life. But in the King James Version, it is always translated conversations. Thirteen times that phrase is used and it is always conversations. Cast off the former conversation and then renew yourself in the spirit of your mind. If you drop it, it equates to the old man. Now, in dropping it, I have to replace it with something a new conversation. So you are told in the book of Joel, let the weak say, I am strong. You read in chapter 3 verse 10, let the weak say, I am strong. For there is no other God. I am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no God. So I set before you, and you make the choice. You can choose life, or you can choose death. You can choose good, or you can choose evil a blessing or a curse. 
It is entirely up to man to choose anything, and look in this manifested world, and you will see what we have chosen. But every morning you see headlines, nothing but disaster. You see what man has chosen. It seems that either he wants it, or it's fed to him, one or the other. Look at the editorials. Do we need that to sell papers, or do we demand it ourselves? But you feed on it morning, noon, and night. We feast on all this charmlessness and have these little internal mental conversations with ourselves. But no, they don't stay there. They become globes. They become objectified and solidified as our manifested world. So this whole manifested world shows us what use or misuse we have made of God's gift. And God's gift is your mind and your speech. And it's not your outward speech, because we know how deceptive it is. You see it morning, noon and night. A salesman comes in and is trained to deceive the buyer. The advertiser is trained to deceive the buyer. And it's all on the outside. God only sees the inside. Man sees the outward appearance and God sees the inner man. So when you look at your inner conversation, you are actually looking at the new nature. That is your nature. And if you don't like it, change it. You put off the old man, and then you put on the new man, and he will show you the salvation of God. Then everything will develop within you. I tell you from my own experience. Before the promise was realized in me, I apparently had this conversation with my brother. Before, I was mentally arguing. We were 5,000 miles apart, and I needed money at that time. And when I found myself arguing with him, I broke it. I broke that whole record, and whether he sent me a penny or not, I loved him and praised him and thanked him and went about my business not knowing where the next one was going to come from because I had spent a fortune by taking a sabbatical and living at the same level that I had lived at in the previous years. And I was spending money like water. So there came that time when I needed money, and in my inner self I had a conversation with him and I thought that was stupid. So I broke that record, and then I had the most glorious conversation with him, like two lovers, because I love him and he loves me. And I exchanged that old man for the new man, changing my relationship with him. Do you know that in the blink of an eye, without asking for it, I got a very big and wonderful check, and without asking for it, I didn't appeal at all. I was taking it out on the person I loved, because I had spent the money myself, like a drunken sailor. And when I broke off the argument and had a most loving conversation with him about family life and all those wonderful things, suddenly out of nowhere came a huge, wonderful check. And I didn't claim it, so I'm telling you from experience. I know it works that way. However, if you feel like arguing and you like arguing so much, it doesn't cost you anything, so you're having the time of your life. But it doesn't stop there. It's going to swell and crystallize and manifest in your world. So watch it, and you know after a while it becomes pleasant to have pleasant conversations. It becomes very pleasant. But if you're honest with yourself, you'll say what this dear one of mine said to me. I never practice it. It came to me and I recorded it and you used it, but I personally never practiced it. Inwardly, I was still going on with the same old conversations, so, I tell you now, as we get closer to the end, believe me, I would not cheat you. I have told you exactly what happened to me in terms of the promise. I have told you exactly what I have proven as to the law. It will not fail you. You can take the law and put it into practice now. Don't wait until tomorrow. Do it now, and know that if you follow these conversations, the promise of Psalm 50 will take shape. It will show you God's salvation. And God's salvation is simply that you wake up as God. That's how he shows you. He came and he is coming into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. And there is only one Jesus Christ. So when it happens, you are Jesus Christ. You don't change your name. You're still Mary. You're still Stan. You're still John. But when it happens, you know who you are. You don't go and ask the judge to change your name to Jesus. You're still Stanley. You're still Mary. You're still Neville. But you know who you are. 
And so when things happen, because you know who you are, these things have to happen. They have to accuse you of being crazy. They must accuse you of being deceitful and leading people astray. It's all part of the scripture, but you are not amazed. You only have pity and mercy for those who cannot go beyond where they are, and then they fall by the wayside. These are the four where the seed falls, the path, among the thorns, among the stones, and then into good soil. And you can't avoid it. You can only scatter the seed and let it fall where it wants to fall, and it will fall in those four kinds of soil. It always falls in four, and as it falls on the good one, it will just rise up into them, and they will have the identical experience that you have had. When it falls in the path, quickly other ideas devour it. When it falls among the thorns, the cares of the world invade it and choke it. If it falls on the rock, and the rock is not prepared to let the root go too deep, the sun scorches it, and suddenly something comes up, and everything disappears. But when the soil has been prepared, it goes deep and gives a hundredfold. That's why I tell you the whole story revolves around you. And one day you will know, you will really know, that you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will not be able to avoid history. It will happen to you too. Do not think for a moment that you will wake up knowing that you are the Lord Jesus Christ, and that those to whom you poured out your soul, who took the loaves and the fishes, will not turn against you and accuse you of being crazy, and therefore of being a wicked man, and that nothing should be done with you. They will completely turn away from you. You will see. But then, being aware of the fact that you have experienced the whole story, you can only go back to the written word of God and know that it had to happen. It just had to happen. And when these signs come, the end is not far away. Now let's go into the silence. Throughout these pages, we have explored the incredible power of the mind and the profound impact our words and thoughts have on our reality. We have learned that each of us possesses an extraordinary gift, a gift that, when used wisely, can turn dreams into reality and transform aspirations into tangible achievements. The essence of Neville Goddard's message is clear. You are the creator of your world. Your thoughts are seeds that, when nurtured with faith and persistence, blossom into experiences and circumstances that reflect your deepest desires. This knowledge is powerful and liberating, but it also carries with it great responsibility. I invite you to reflect on all that you have learned and to put these teachings into practice in your daily life. Start each day with a clear vision of what you want to achieve. Have internal conversations that empower you and propel you forward. Remember, consistency and determination are key. Do not be discouraged by obstacles, for they are part of the manifestation process and prepare you to receive with gratitude and wisdom what you have envisioned. As you move forward on your path, never forget these words of Goddard. Imagination is the workshop of God. In that workshop, you are the artisan, molding and sculpting the life you wish to live. Embrace this truth with your whole being and allow it to guide your every thought and action. As I conclude this audiobook, I want to thank you for allowing us to join you on this journey. I hope Neville Goddard's teachings have touched you deeply and provided you with the tools you need to manifest a bright future full of possibilities. Remember, the power is in your hands. Imagine with courage, act with purpose, and live with passion. Your world manifested by your imagination is waiting to be discovered.